if we're training a neural network to classify images or to solve some other computer vision problem, ideally we would have a massive data set consisting of millions of images that we could use to train our neural network. But in practice, often our data set is much smaller than that. We may only have a few thousand images, maybe we only have a few hundred images. So how can we deal with the fact that we might not have as much training data as we would like? There are two very important techniques. One technique is called data augmentation. We discussed that in the previous video. And another very important technique is called transfer learning. The idea behind transfer learning is that you start with a neural network which has already been trained on a huge data set such as ImageNet. ImageNet has 14 million images. This neural network that you take as your starting point typically will have a convolutional base mm -hmm consisting of several or many convolutional layers followed by a few dense layers. And what we're going to do is we're going to freeze all of the coefficients that belong to the convolutional base. This first part of the neural network, which in this image is shown as the yellow and orange layers, those are the convolutional layers. Those, those layers are called the convolutional base of our neural network. What we're going to do in transfer learning is we're going to freeze all of the weights that belong to the convolutional base of this neural network. Those weights, those parameters are frozen. They have already been trained and they were trained on a huge data set and those parameters are now just frozen. And all we're going to do is we're only going to retrain from scratch the, the, the weights that belong to the final few dense layers of this neural network. So when we train our neural network using our own small data set, we are only going to be tuning the weights that belong to these final few dense layers. That's a relatively small number of weights. So the fact that we have a small data set is okay. All the weights that belong to this convolutional base, those weights are just frozen. They've already been trained. Now you might say, this convolutional base, that was trained on ImageNet. What makes, you, what makes us think it will be useful on our own data set? But in the process of training this convolutional base on ImageNet, which contains 14 million natural images, this convolutional base has learned to detect patterns which arise throughout natural images, including in our own small data set. So this convolutional base will still be useful to us because the patterns it has learned to recognize are present not only in the ImageNet dataset, but in, in most natural images. So in this video, we're going to use transfer learning to solve the cats versus dogs classification problem. Remember, in the cats and dogs classification problem, we have only 2,000 training images, 1,000 cat images and 1,000 dog images. So that's a pretty small data set. We're going to take as our starting point the neural network architecture shown here. This is a famous architecture called VGG16. VGG stands for Visual Geometry Group, which is a computer vision research group at Oxford. This architecture is one of the famous deep learning architectures in the history of deep learning. In the year 2014, this architecture was used to win the ImageNet challenge. So we're going to take as our starting point this neural network with this architecture trained on the ImageNet data set. We're going to keep only the convolutional base, which is shown in yellow and orange. We're going to throw away the final few dense layers. We're going to add our own new dense layers to the top of this architecture. And when we train on our data set, we're going to train only those final few dense layers the convolutional base will re remain frozen. Now, if we look at this convolutional base, here we have a couple convolutional layers, a max pulling layer, three more convolutional layers, a max pulling layer, three more convolutional layers, a max pulling layer, and then three more, max, three more convolutional layers, and then finally another max pulling layer. If you look at the output of this convolutional base, it's a multidimensional array, which has four rows, four columns, and a depth of 512. So if you take an image, like an image of a cat or an image of a dog, and run it through this convolutional base, what you're going to get as output of this convolutional base is going to be a multidimensional array, a tensor, which has four rows, four columns, and a depth of 512. 
that tensor, that multidimensional array, is going to be the input to our dense layer. We're going to take that array, four rows, four columns, depth of 512. We're going to flatten it into a, just a vector, just a flat vector. And then that vector, we're going to feed it into a dense layer. And when we train our, net, our neural network, we're only going to be training the final few dense layers. When you take an image and, and plug it into this neural network and run it through the neural network, and you get your output array, which is four by four by 512, and then when you flatten that array, what you get is a vector, just a flat vector that has 8,192 components. That vector can be thought of as a feature vector that describes your image. We have a new feature vector with 8,192 components that describes our original Im input image. In this video, we're going to take the simplest possible approach to transfer learning, which is for each image in our training data set, we're going to run the image through this convolutional base. We're going to take the output array and flatten it. Now we have a feature vector with 8,192 components. And then we're going to just perform classification on those feature vectors rather than on the original images. So we're going to train a dense neural network with a few layers to classify those feature vectors as either dog versus cat. In this approach, which is like the simplest way of doing transfer learning, computing these feature vectors can be viewed as just a pre-processing step. So everything we do with this convolutional base can be viewed as just a pre-processing step. As a pre-processing step, we take each image in our training data set, we run it through this convolutional base, we get an output array which is flattened into a vector that has 8,192 components, and that's the result of our pre-processing. And then the pre-processing is done. And then all we need to do is train a dense neural network to classify those feature vectors. So let's implement this using Keras. Keras makes it easy to do transfer learning. We're going to solve the cats and dogs classification problem using transfer learning. So here we have a bunch of directories that specify where to find the training data and the validation data and the test data. And here we have a section of code where we are loading our pre-trained model. This variable conv base is our pre-trained VGG16 model. This argument weights equals image net, where this argument is telling Keras that we want to use the version of the model that is pre-trained on the image net data set. And this argument include top equals false. That means that we only are going to keep the convolutional base of, our, of this model. We're going to omit the final few dense layers we are only going to keep the convolutional base. That's why this variable is named conv base. And then input shape, this is just the shape of one of our input images. So this model expects for the input image to have 150 rows, 150 columns, and a depth of three. Here we are creating an image data generator object. This is, the, this is a class provided by TensorFlow. This object is going to help us read in training data one batch at a time. And in this line, we're declaring that the batch size for stochastic gradient descent is going to be 20. So one batch will consist of 20 training images. In this section of code, we're defining a function which is going to take each of our training images and run it through our pre-trained model. The output of that pre-trained model is a tensor, a multidimensional array, that has four rows, four columns, and a depth of 512. We're going to have one such output array for each training image. And each of those output arrays for all of the training images are going to be stored in this array called features. And this, this array features is one of the outputs of this function. As we pre-process each of the training images, we're also going to make a note of what is the label for each training image, either cat or dog. And the label for each of our training images is going to be stored in this array called labels. This variable here called generator is an iterator, which is going to do the work of iterating through the training data one batch at a time. This argument directory tells our iterator where to find the training data. This next argument tells our iterator that when it reads in an image from the hard drive or from the solid state drive, 
that image should be reshaped to have 150 rows and 150 columns. This argument tells the iterator what the batch size is, so 20. This argument indicates that we're doing binary classification. So here's a for loop that's looping through the training data one batch at a time. So we take a batch of data, we, we run it through our pre-trained model. That's what's happening here when we call this predict function. We're running the batch of data through the, through the pre-trained model. The outputs that we get when we run the current batch through our pre-trained model, those outputs are stored in this array features and the corresponding labels are stored in this array labels. And then finally, we return both features and labels. So what this function does is it just takes each training image in our training data set and just runs it through the pre-trained model and just stores the output. So now that we've defined this extract features function, in this section of code, we are calling the extract features function on the training data and on the validation data and on the test data. So this pre-processing step is going to be performed for the training data and for the validation data and also for the test data. Let's run this section of code. Next, in this section of code, we have the flattening step. I mentioned that when you take an image, a training image, and run it through the pre-trained model, the result, the output, is a multi-dimensional array, a tensor with four rows, four columns, and a depth of 512. This section of code here, this is the part where we take that multidimensional array and we flatten it into a vector, just a vector with 8,192 components. So now at this point, we have finished our pre-processing. For each training image in our training data set, we have computed a feature vector with 8,192 components. And now we're going to create a very small, densely connected neural network that classifies those new feature vectors that we computed in the pre-processing step. So in this section of code, we are specifying the architecture of our neural network. So we're telling TensorFlow the input is going to be a vector with this many components. This turns out to be 8,192. If we do 4 times 4 times 512, we get 8,192. So that's the shape of an input to this neural network. And we're going to have a one hidden layer that has 256 nodes. Each of those nodes is going to use the ReLU activation function. And then the output layer is going to have a single node which uses the sigmoid activation function. That's what we use when we're doing a binary classification problem the output layer should have one node and it should use the sigmoid activation function. This line of code compiles our model. When we compile the model, we tell TensorFlow that during training, we should use the RMS prop algorithm, which is similar in spirit to stochastic gradient descent. The, and we tell TensorFlow that the loss function we should use is the binary cross entropy loss function. That's what we use when we're doing binary classification. And then at, we're telling TensorFlow, as training progresses, we want to keep track of the classification accuracy. We're going to monitor our progress throughout training by looking at the classification accuracy. And here's the line of code where we actually train our neural network. We're going to use 30 epochs. We're going to use a batch size of 20. We're going to monitor our progress on the validation data set. Remember, Stochastic gradient descent or RMS prop is not allowed to look at the validation data set during training, but we can still monitor our progress on the validation data set. That's how we can know if we are starting to overfit or not. So let's run this section of code. And now, uh, even though we're running this code on a CPU, training is pretty fast because it's only a small model. We have only one hidden layer with only with 256 nodes. It's a small model, so training is pretty fast. It would be faster on a GPU, but it's still okay on a CPU. So now we're done with training. Let's take a look at our classification accuracy at each epoch of stochastic gradient descent. So what, what we're looking at here, the this dotted curve, this is the classification accuracy computed looking at the training data. And this classification accuracy is approaching one, 
This solid curve, this is the classification accuracy computed using the validation data set. And this is leveling off at about 90%. So we're getting about 90% classification accuracy on the validation data set. This is much better than what we got previously. When we did cats versus dogs classification without using transfer learning, we got like 80% classification accuracy. Now we're getting 90% classification accuracy. So it's a big improvement. And let's look at the training loss. Here, this dotted curve, this tells us the objective function value computed looking at the training data. It's approaching zero. And this solid curve, this is the objective function value computed looking at the validation data. So it's leveling off here. And we can see it's starting to get a little worse towards the end. So we're starting to overfit near the end. So by using transfer learning, we were able to do much better than we did without using transfer learning. There's more to be said about transfer learning. This, what we've done so far is only the simplest way to do transfer learning. There's other, way, there's other things you can do too. For example, once you train your final few dense layers, as we've done here, you can then unfreeze all the weights in your convolutional base. You can unfreeze them and then refine them a little bit for your particular data set. That's another, that's another variation on the idea of transfer learning. You can also combine transfer learning with data augmentation. If we did that in this case, we could get even better accuracy, but even without data augmentation, we still have a nice improvement. If you wanna learn more about these slightly more sophisticated ways of doing transfer learning, I highly recommend reading the book Deep Learning with Python by Francois Cholet.